Today, we'll ask copper expert and macro analyst Simon Hunt whether his dire forecast has improved at all, or perhaps, perhaps gotten even worse. Simon, thanks so much for joining us today, all the way from Dubai. That's right. I appreciate <clears throat> you staying up late. I know it's late there, your time. No, uh, that's uh, for you. No problem at all. <laughs> You're such a gentleman. All right, look, well, let's let's bang through all this efficiently so that you can uh, get to bed at a decent hour tonight. Um, let's start with the question that I ask you um, to kick the discussions off every time you come on this channel. Simon, what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? I think we, we have a false false dawn. I think that as we look out to 2025, 2026, we will basically see three phases of uh, ups and downs. Between now and the middle of the year, we will have a, a very large correction in global equity, bond, and commodity markets. This will force the Fed and other central banks to ease monetary policy, produce a form of QE, and rate stop will start falling. That will result in a resurgence of inflation, particularly energy and food prices. The dollar will start falling sharply with inflation rising, uh, equity and commodity markets will surge to new highs by the end of 2025. But at the same time, the long end of the interest rate curve, which central banks cannot control, will be rising, the yields will be rising very sharply. For instance, we have 10-year treasuries yielding well over 10%. That will result in, in the highly leveraged uh, parts of the global economy basically going bust, which will lead us into the coming depression. Okay. All right. So um, it sounds like from the last time you were on, the overall um, arc still sort of remains the same, where yeah. we have this short-term weakness that forces the hands of the central banks. Um, their actions kind of goose asset prices, um, except they also dramatically goose uh, yields. And basically, it's the weight of, of those higher yields on the over-leveraged global system that basically kind of break everything and bring us into what you're calling a global depression with a D. Yeah, correct. I think there, uh, there is an additional factor that uh, we have to add to the fragility of the global economic and financial structure, and that is the war syndrome. The war has been perceived by markets as something way out, far away from America, doesn't concern us, etc., etc. But the war is going to, probably by the middle of this year, is going to take on a completely different posture, which is basically whether it's whether you call it World War Three, I'm not sure. Though in my gut, it's saying it's going to be World War Three. Because what's what's at stake for Russia is the security of its borders, which NATO members ever since 1991 have failed to keep their promises. So, and it's particularly relevant for Russia in an age of hypersonic technology, 
whereby probably within two to three years, America will have mastered that technology and will be in a position to locate hypersonic missiles close to Russia's borders, which would enable them to hit the big cities within three to four minutes. For America, what is at stake is really the breaking up of the growing alliance that was taking place between Germany, Russia, and China. Had that progressed, it would have led to the three countries controlling Eurasia, which if you go back to 1904, to Halford Mackinder's treatise, he who controls the heartland, which is Eurasia, controls the world. So the first part of <clears throat> what's been taking place from America's point of view is the breakup of that alliance, which they've successfully done. And, and is that, um, so what's interesting is this might be one of the first times that viewers are, are hearing of this sort of concept. Um, I think everybody, most people know that Russia and China have been cozying up to each other more of late and that the America, the West's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine has probably only pushed them a little bit closer together. But the fact that you're kind of pairing Germany in with those three may be new to a lot of viewers here. Uh, so I guess two questions. Um, one, how long had the German component of that been in play leading up until recently? And, and I imagine the you think the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline was to somehow, you know, separate Germany Correct. and Russia. Yeah, it was and, to and break I guess that. Was that was, yeah. And was that an effective tactic in yes. splintering that, that, that relationship? Yes. yes, yes. So how long, so how long has that, that uh, triangular relationship been occurring? Was that the question? Yeah, exactly. I'm just not sure too many people, at least well, I wasn't aware that Germany was playing in that back, angle goes back a very long way. I would say it goes back to when the Berlin Wall fell. And I've forgotten the date, but that's early, early 1990s. All right. And so um, obviously Germany and Russia were trading partners. Germany was getting an increasing amount of its energy from Russia. Uh, and is the theory that America started realizing, oh my gosh, if there's a component in Europe, Russia, and then China all working together, they then control the the heartland, as you're saying here, and that becomes a a, a block right. that we just that's too much power for us to it, it tips the scales of a global exactly. power structure too much. So 